So, welcome once again to uh, Friends of Derry City Cemetery. Shimmy here and Gap and Patton Films. Uh, we're making these uh, historical films about uh, Derry in the Northwest. And we know you all enjoy them, especially people that are overseas. And today we're at uh, Ebrington Barracks. So most people would decide to start down at the Peace Bridge and come across. We've actually come here at the main entrance in Brown and Drive. Uh, it's a beautiful, uh, massive, historical uh, military barracks, which is now symbolising and manifesting how things have transformed the peace now. It's a hub of uh, a hotel, bakeries, uh, I can smell the lovely buns there, and uh, restaurants, bars, uh, great walk, and St Colm's House and St Colm's Park just beside us here. So hopefully we'll walk around and I can entertain you with some interesting historical facts, some stories about the place. Many of them you probably never read in the books and that. But it's uh, steeped in history. And sure, we'll take a walk around and see. So this is the entrance here where you would have got uh, searched and uh, the, uh, your details checked as you do at all military installations and that. So a wee bit of history about this site. This, these barracks were opened up in 1841. Uh, it was called after the Earl of uh, Ebrington. I can't remember, Montesquieu or something was his name and he laid the foundation stone. But prior to that there, it also had military uh, significance. Didn't right back to the siege of Derry because this was actually what was known as Strong's Orchard and the Jacobite forces that had the city under siege in 1688-89 actually were pissed here and firing across at the city. So the, the military strategic, strategic position of the site dates are way back even to the siege of Derry. So in 1841, which was put that on the context, was just what, five, six years before the Great Hunger in Ireland. And I'd let the uh, let you know that having a military barracks now, and everybody associates having a military barracks as being uh, uh, a good e economic driver because they all need supplies and it brings money and prosperity to an area. But back in the day in the 1800s when this barracks was open, believe you me, soldiers were regarded as being the dregs of society. These were people who either went under the army, you were in prison, or you were in prison and the army, and nobody wanted them near them. And then there was always this uh, uh, concern that uh, uh, ladies of the night prostitution would always, so even down at the Curra camp and all the different uh, barracks around the country, that these soldiers, young fat men and all that there, were always up to no good, thieving and stealing and chasing after women, and basically, Nobody wanted them near them. It was only after the First World War they sort of came, became half respectable to be, uh, uh, to, uh, to be a soldier and they have a military barracks beside you. In fact, during the First World War, the accommodation for soldiers and the new recruits, thousands and thousands of them, was so scarce that they used to bullet them around local houses and they had to stop it after a few months because it ended up that uh, the women and the girls were uh, uh, ending up pregnant or whatever and they thought it was a bad idea so most of the in-house military accommodation here is these brown brick buildings and you can see they're like dormitory style and that and uh, over here uh, with the officers quarters and that and yet there was a very very rigid class distinction within the military still to this day where uh, the ordinary ranks the URs uh, basically were the bottom of the pyramid and the officers uh, the gentlemen in the upper class and you had a lot of it here because Back in the day when this opened, it wasn't, you weren't talking about tanks and military uh, 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 armoured vehicles and that, you were talking about horses. And then uh, the officers were usually great horsemen with stibbles all down along here, a lot of horse dung. And uh, so we had a lot of the, the sport involved with, uh, with uh, you know, fox hunting and that there would have, would have emerged from the officer class from within here was built originally as a star fort 
It shows you here the original perimeter wall of the star fort. So just like all our forts, it was for defence. So you've, uh, you build a wall around it and then you put gun emplacements in that. And you can still see a lot of it still visible here today. Because right up until from 1841, right up until 2002, three, the this was a military installation, right up under the troubles. Mortar bombs getting fired on here, rocket attacks, bomb attacks, people died on here. Uh, a lot of very sad things that you would get normally in any military barracks is uh, uh, soldiers maybe getting a Dear John letter and committing suicide and things like that. Then you had some cases of uh, the soldiers, some of the soldiers getting a bit pissed off and actually uh, shooting the officer. So it was once a huge military installation uh, and involved in all the troubles uh, in our history. It has now turned into a very vibrant cultural quarter with the hotel over here. And behind us here we've got the embankment bar and grill. I had a meal on there one time, uh, it was lovely. And right beside it where they've blended in is the old walls with the fire and emplacements and that. <laughs> so it was very common, uh, was very, was very practical, pragmatic with all military installations. You had a huge barrack square. Anybody that's familiar with any more barracks, military barracks anywhere knows you have to have a, a square for your marching and your parade and your drill. So this is our square. And they actually say that this here square here is actually bigger than Tra Trafalgar Square in London. And also up here, which is now the hotel, was the centerpiece of it, and you had a clock tower. So if you think back to 1841 and 1900s, uh, it was very important for the general public to know the time and watches in that timepieces were expensive and so you always had all these uh, public clocks. So there's a clock, a four-fist clock here and the other one over here at the guild hall. So it's always nice visiting the site but you can never recreate the sounds and the smells associated with a military barrack. So back in the day when it was all horses, there'd been a lot of horse manure and a lot of sounds of horses and that, and the hoofs clapping and that. You'd have a lot, a lot of marching and uh, a lot of parading. There was a lot of open days here and a lot happened here. And uh, I can remember pictures of uh, them doing all their uh, gymnastics displays and all these military bands marching and that. So you'd have all the sounds of music and now the music that we have here now is entertainment and um, we've had uh, the one uh, big day from uh, BBC Radio 1 here and we've had lots of entertainers here so I mean if you grew up when I grew up it means a lot more to you than it might be to the ordinary person or the younger person because when I was growing up this was all about uh, shooting, bombing, arrests uh, over here was actually the headquarters on the day of Bloody Sunday where all the decisions were made and, and where the order came through for the uh, send the paras in was over here. Uh, going right back to the 1920s, we have over here the guard house. The guard house under military law, you didn't go to the police station, you would go to your, the military police there. And during the 1920s, a lot of people from Derry, Tyrone, Donegal and Sligo were... Uh, 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 in jail over here in the guard house and there was that men and them they actually had to put up uh, porta cabins and imprison them down here at St Columns Park and right up to the 1950s we had an arms raid here by the IRA and the border campaign during the 1940s when we had World War II and this was a hive of activity there was a big complaints from the unionist community that there was men sympathetic to Irish republicanism uh, actually working on here as civilians because it provided a lot of civilian employment. Now, there was a funny story here I came across in the 1930s. Uh, and until 1938, the British military in here still had responsibility for Dunry Fort down in Donegal. So even though you had the Gardaí and the Irish Army and all down there, you still had British military trucks and British military personnel coming up and down with supplies from here to Dunry Fort 
and that, which sounds very rare now, British military trucks crossing over and by going through Bonkrana and whatever. But a wee story was that the railway line came up here from Dublin, and so it was the the most practical way to get to Dublin was for they take the railway, and it came through Derry up through Port of Down and then went on down. In the 1930s, I came across there was a company of Irish soldiers, Oglan Iron, the Irish Army, Irish military, and they were on their way from Dublin to Donegal, and the train broke down and they got stranded in their full uniform in Derry. So they're sitting in Derry, in uh, what's then Northern Ireland, with the B Specials, uh, the British Army, and the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And you have these 30 men from the Irish Army on their way to Donegal, and they get stranded in Derry. I think the train broke down. And so their compatriots in the British military invited them to stay overnight here in Ebrington and then proceed back on to Donegal the next day. So of course when they brought these Irish soldiers through them over the Ebrington barracks and somebody seen them, the rumour spread round there <laughs> that the British were moving out and the Irish army was taking over, which was uh, a bit funny. But also at the same time, uh, Sometimes when the Gardaí or anybody of a military nature uh, got stuck, they were offered accommodation. Here there was a lot of camaraderie uh, between them and there was a lot of boxing matches between the British and the British Army on here and the Royal Navy when the Royal Navy took it over. And of course, we didn't have the Peace Bridge. So it was actually quite an isolated spot away on the water side, which had to be, uh, you had to get here after going over Craig Avon Bridge. Before Craig Avon Bridge, it was Carlisle Bridge. Uh, and then, but there was a toll on it, so it used to be cheaper when there was big functions on over here in the guild hall or on any of the halls or anything happening that they had down here, they had uh, a ferry. And so you had this ferry brought the soldiers and anybody was working here over and back across. And uh, you used to see things saying in the guild hall after the function, it used to say. Uh, the function's over at 11 p.m. and the ferry for Ebrington Barracks will be leaving at 11.15 so you can straight over here back and forth uh, across the ferries. Now here on here at Stitch and Weave is really really beautiful with a blend in the old with the new. Maybe someday we might get a chance to get in there. During the First World War this was a hive of activity and I think it was the Cheshire Regiment was stationed here and when war was declared in August 1914 the Cheshire Regiment were one of those regiments that were dispatched off to take part in the first engagements in the First World War. So of course there would have been dairymen involved with the Cheshire Regiment because the tradition then was for whatever regiment was in the barracks to recruit locally. So you, when you go over to Cheshire and you see the records of the Cheshire Regiment, you'll see a lot of dairy names like uh, Bradley and Coyle and Doherty and that. During the Second World War, it was the South Wales borders were here, so you actually go to uh, Arnhem and battlefields in the Second World War and you see men from Derry buried there as well in the South Wales uh, borders. Because the traditional recruiting ground for around here was the Royal Anniskillen Fusiliers known as the Skins. So there we have now with three bridges across, Craig Avon Bridge, Peace Bridge and on down, we have the Foil Bridge, but back in the day we only had the Wan Bridge and so over here was sort of like out of the way, a bit isolated, but now it's great with the Peace Bridge, now a lot, a lot of people are coming here that have never come before. Do we want to go down and have a look at the walls and the original fortifications? Francis Ledwidge, one of Ireland's most famous poets, was stationed here during the First World War. Uh, it was wee cottage in Slain. And uh, I was in reception years ago, and an old lady was telling me that her mother remembered Francis Ledwidge. And that it was a wild man for chasing the women. And he met uh, some romantic, uh, he wrote some romantic poetry while he's here. Behind us here is the Second World War, is the, the, the commemoration for the sailors. So a huge connections with the Royal Navy took over here and became what was known as a stone warship, which was like it's a warship, but uh, it never goes to sea because it's made of stone and it was called HMS Ferret. 
So this here connects the links between uh, the Atlantic convoys of World War II and the sailors and there's an identical there's an identical statue in Newfoundland over in Canada of this sailor representing the sailors. So one of the, when they were renovating around here, they found one of the original guns from the old fortifications. Here. Massive gun here. And here's the original walls fissing the fissing the foil. So as you can see, it's got its walls around it and it's got the river to its front, so it's got good transport links, it's got the railways, it's got the river, and then it's around it, so it was, would have been pretty easily defended. You need, you need to be of a certain age, but whenever the, the, the British Army was on here during the Troubles from uh, 1970 until they departed, if you had seen beer kegs all over here, <laughs> they'd have been calling the bomb disposal screwed, and now it's full of them all around all the different uh, pubs and hotels. So if anybody's ever been to Fort Dunry, you can see this is how this should look. So all part of the, the defensive nature of the It's actually quite beautiful here. When I was a young boy, uh, we used to sell the poopers over here. You might have seen our film about dodging bombs and bullets selling the Belfast Telegraph. And while we were at the poopers, me and my friends sat over there, as well as watching the wildlife and the foil, the guillemots and all black divers, we called them. We used to watch over in fascination here because in the 1970s, it was just, it, was, it must have been, it was like Heathrow Airport. It was that busy with helicopters landing, taking off helicopters landing, taking off helicopters landing all the time. So, if you're not from Derry City, or even if you are from Derry City, this is one of the most fascinating places to walk about. I mean, I never believed in my lifetime that I'd be able to come over here and see these walls and that, because when I was growing up, this was heavily fortified and, and militarized and that. And even if you were messing about down here, no, there was a danger you could have got shot by one of the sentries from uh, the, the British Army and whatever. But look at it now, the, the barbed wire's gone and all the military and security apparatus and all that there. And it's actually absolutely delightful to uh, uh, stroll around it and then maybe call in for a uh, uh, bite to eat in one of the many establishments around here. I've met a few ex squatties while I was on holidays and when they heard my accent it says you're obviously from Derry, London Derry and one of them regaled me with tales of his days uh, marching out here. They tell me about saluting long way up short way down there to do a piss stick and thing and all they would. Military precision and so a lot of the pomp and ceremony went on here. Isn't it funny now it would be full of thousands and thousands of young people enjoying themselves at the Cullen's Amusement 
and at all the, 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 the raves and the, the music functions and all, all for the better I would say. <laughs>